Ingersoll's lecture on the mistakes of Moses from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Now and then someone asks me why I am endeavoring to interfere with the religious faith of others, and why I try to take from the world the consolation naturally arising from a belief in eternal fire. And I answer, I want to do what little I can to make my country truly free. I want to broaden the intellectual horizon of our people. I want it so that we can differ upon all those questions and yet grasp each other's hands in genuine friendship. I want in the first place to free the clergy. I am a great friend of theirs, but they don't seem to have found it out generally. I want it so that every minister will be not a parrot, not an owl sitting upon the limb of the tree of knowledge and hooting the hoots that have been hooted for 1,800 years, but I want it so that each one can be an investigator, a thinker, and I want to make his congregation grand enough so that they will not only allow him to think, but will demand that he shall think and give to them the honest truth of his thought. As it is now, ministers are employed like attorneys for the plaintiff or the defendant. If a few people know of a young man in the neighborhood, maybe who has not a good constitution, he may not be healthy enough to be wicked, a young man who has shown no decided talent, it occurs to them to make him a minister. They contribute and send him to some school. If it turns out that that young man has more of the man in him than they thought, and he changes his opinion, everyone who contributed will feel himself individually swindled, and they will follow that young man to the grave with the poison shafts of malice and slander. I want it so that everyone will be free, so the pulpit will not be a pillory. They have in Massachusetts, at a place called Andover, a kind of minister factory, and every professor in that factory takes an oath once in every five years, that is as long as an oath will last, that not only has he not during the last five years, but so help him God, he will not during the next five years intellectually advance. And probably there is no oath he could easier keep. Since the foundation of that institution, there has not been one case of perjury. They believe the same creed they first taught when the foundation stone was laid. And now when they send out a minister, they brand him as hardware from Sheffield and Birmingham. And every man who knows where he was educated knows his creed, knows every argument of his creed, every book that he reads, and just what he amounts to intellectually and knows he will shrink and shrivel and become solemnly stupid day after day until he meets with death. It is all wrong. It is cruel. Those men should be allowed to grow. They should have the air of liberty and the sunshine of thought. I want to free the schools of our country. I want it so that when a professor in a college finds some fact inconsistent with Moses, he will not hide the fact. I wish to see an eternal divorce and separation between church and schools. The common school is the bread of life, but there should be nothing taught except what somebody knows, and anything else should not be maintained by a system of general taxation. I want its professors so that they will tell everything they find, that they will be free to investigate in every direction, and will not be trammeled by the superstitions of our day. What has religion to do with facts? Nothing. Is there any such thing as Methodist mathematics, Presbyterian botany, Catholic astronomy, or Baptist biology? What has any form of superstition or religion to do with a fact or with any science? Nothing but to hinder, delay, or embarrass. I want then to free the schools, and I want to free the politicians, so that a man will not have to pretend he is a Methodist, or his wife a Baptist, or his grandmother a Catholic so that he can go through a campaign, and when he gets through, will find none of the dust of hypocrisy on his knees. 
I want the people splendid enough that when they desire men to make laws for them, they will take one who knows something, who has brains enough to prophesy the destiny of the American Republic, no matter what his opinions may be on any religious subject. Suppose we are in a storm out at sea, and the billows are washing over our ship, and it is necessary that someone should reef the topsail, and a man presents himself. Would you stop him at the foot of the mast to find out his opinion on the five points of Calvinism? What has that to do with it? Congress has nothing to do with baptism or any particular creed, and from what little experience I have had in Washington, very little to do with any kind of religion whatever. Now I hope this afternoon this magnificent and splendid audience will forget that they are Baptists or Methodists and remember that they are men and women. These are the highest titles humanity can bear, and every title you add belittles them. Man is the highest. Woman is the highest. Let us remember that our views depend largely upon the country in which we happen to live. Suppose we were born in Turkey. Most of us would have been Mohammedans. And when we read in the book that when Mohammed visited heaven, he became acquainted with an angel named Gabriel, who was so broad between his eyes that it would take a smart camel 300 days to make the journey, we probably would have believed it. If we did not, people would say, that young man is dangerous. He is trying to tear down the fabric of our religion. What do you propose to give us instead of that angel? We cannot afford to trade off an angel of that size for nothing. Or if we had been born in India, we would have believed in a god with three heads. Now we believe in three gods with one head. And so we might make a tour of the world and see that every superstition that could be imagined by the brain of man has been, in some place, held to be sacred. Now someone says, the religion of my father and mother is good enough for me. Suppose we all said that. Where would be the progress of the world? We would have the rudest and most barbaric religion, religion which no one could believe. I do not believe that it is showing real respect to our parents to believe something simply because they did. Every good father and every good mother wish their children to find out more than they knew. Every good father wants his son to overcome some obstacle that he could not grapple with. And if you wish to reflect credit on your father and mother, do it by accomplishing more than they did, because you live in a better time. Every nation has had what you call a sacred record, and the older, the more sacred, the more contradictory, and the more inspired is the record. We, of course, are not an exception, and I propose to talk a little about what is called the Pentateuch, a book or a collection of books said to have been written by Moses. And right here in the commencement, let me say that Moses never wrote one word of the Pentateuch. Not one word was written until he had been dust and ashes for hundreds of years. But as the general opinion is that Moses wrote these books, I have entitled this lecture The Mistakes of Moses. For the sake of this lecture, we will admit that he wrote it. Nearly every maker of religion has commenced by making the world. And it is one of the safest things to do, because no one can contradict as having been present, and it gives free scope to the imagination. These books, in times when there was a vast difference between the educated and the ignorant, became inspired, and people bowed down and worshipped them. I saw a little while ago a Bible with immense oaken covers with hasps and clasps large enough to almost for a penitentiary, and I can imagine how that book would be regarded by barbarians in Europe when not more than one person in a dozen could read and write. In imagination I saw it carried into the cathedral, heard the chant of the priest, saw the swinging of the censer, and the smoke rising. And when that Bible was put on the altar, 
I can imagine the barbarians looking at it and wondering what influence that book could have on their lives and future. I do not wonder that they imagined it was inspired. None of them could write a book, and consequently when they saw it, they adored it. They were stricken with awe, and rascals took advantage of that awe. Now they say that the book is inspired. I do not care whether it is or not. The question is, is it true? If it is true, it doesn't need to be inspired. Nothing needs inspiration except a falsehood or a mistake. A fact never went into partnership with a miracle. Truth scorns the assistance of wonders. A fact will fit every other fact in the universe, and that is how you can tell whether it is or not a fact. A lie will not fit anything except a lie made for the express purpose. And finally, someone gets tired of lying, and the last lie will not fit the next fact, and then there is a chance for inspiration. Right then and there, a miracle is needed. The real question is, in the light of science, in the light of the brain and heart of the 19th century, is this book true?